John chapter 18 this morning. I'm going to start at verse number 1, read down to verse number 12. The Bible says, When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, how apropos that in the garden was sung this morning, into the which He entered and His disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed Him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with His disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon Him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered Him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am He. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword under thy sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Anna first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. This morning, by God's grace, our attention will be focused on the goings-on in the Garden of Gethsemane. This, of course, is after Jesus' blood-stained prayer that we read about few verses earlier. And we pick up this account as Christ is about to be confronted by the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot, and his blood agreement with the Roman legion as they come to deliver Jesus Christ before both Pilate and the people. In this account, between Christ's prayer and his binding by the Roman soldiers, we'll see four important lessons that are just as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago. This morning, the title of the message is Gleanings from the Garden. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look to your word. We thank you for this place that has afforded us uh, a location, Lord, to resort as the body of Christ, Lord, to sing praises unto your name, to fellowship, and, Father, to preach your word. And Father, this morning, I pray that if there be somebody here that's wrestling with the truth of the Bible, that's wrestling with the truth in general, Lord. Lord, I pray this morning that you'd help me to be a blessing to those individuals, and I pray that your word would open up their heart. Perhaps, Lord, there's somebody here looking for a church. Lord, I pray that you would open up their heart, Father, to a church that is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and his apostles. And Father, maybe there's somebody here that says, Preacher, I'm saved, I'm born again, I've been baptized, but, but I'm, I'm struggling with some things. And Father, if that's the case, I pray this morning that you would use this message to prick hearts, to chastise. For as we look at these gleanings from the garden, I pray that you would use this message for your honor and for your glory. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we ask it, and all of God's children said... This is one of my favorite accounts in the Word of God. That's kind of unfair because usually every time I read the Bible, I usually say this is one of my favorite accounts in the Bible. But this is one of my favorite accounts in the Bible. This is one of my favorite accounts of the three main accounts that are given of the garden. 
And this one here is, in my opinion, a little more of a fuller account. There's some things that are mentioned here that are not mentioned over in Luke's gospel, and there's some things that are mentioned here that are not mentioned in Matthew's gospel. But those other gospels also add a few things that are not mentioned here in John. So we'll kind of uh, piggyback a little bit and look at some of those in just a brief moment. But there's some wonderful truths here from this particular passage of Scripture that I believe that you and I will be blessed by this morning. As we've mentioned before, the Bible today is just as relevant as it's been for the last 2,000 years. Amen. Uh, I have this problem with people that say that the Bible isn't relevant. And folks, uh, the Bible is about as relevant as the person sitting next to you is relevant. That's right. And you're going to see this morning that there are some things that this passage deals with that the Holy Spirit of God knew about 2,000 years ago about you before it was, you were even around. And you're going to say to yourself, probably at the end of this sermon, you're going to say, man, it was almost as if that message was for me. And may I say it might be. It just might be. You'll probably say something like, well, that pastor must know something about me because somebody said something to him about me. Let me just say something to you. The only people that I really want to know about is me, and I'm not too sure about me. <laughs> I don't know what was going on in your life this week. I don't, want a nose, I don't want to put my nose in your life, okay? I'm, I'm sure you don't want to have your nose in my life, but uh, you're going to notice some things in this passage where the Lord is going to mention some things that I think that He put in there by, uh, by, by providence of God to just mess up other denominations. You're going to see that in a few minutes here. You say, do you believe all that happens in the Word of God? Yeah, and then some. Amen. And then some. But I want you to notice the first lesson here that we see from the garden, or if you will, the gleaning from the garden. And the first here is found in verses 1 through 10. And you'll notice here that Jesus is at this brook, Kidron, and he's in the garden with his disciples. And of course, we know that he had sweat drops of blood, and he was concerned about, well, the fact that in just a few hours he would be crucified. And as a human being, 100% human, he would be concerned about that. Can we say amen to that? Yeah. I mean, Jesus is 100% God, 100% human. You say, I can't understand that. Well, I can't understand how they split an atom, but they did it anyway. But God is 100%, Jesus Christ is 100% God, 100% man. So the 100% man part is the one that is praying to the Father saying, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'm glad he said that. And then we know that as he's doing this and the disciples are with him, we know from another passage of the, from the Gospels that the disciples could not stay up with him for one hour. They end up falling asleep. But all this time behind the scenes as Jesus is praying, the devil is plotting. That's right. And by the way, that's a wonderful scene for you. Because as you're praying and as you're interceding, as you're doing the things that you need to do with God, that the devil is still plotting and isn't ceased by your prayer. And the devil is plotting and he's doing this through a man named Judas Iscariot, who ironically all letters add up to 13. And in verse number 3 it says, Judas then, having received a band of men and of officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Verse 4 is an interesting verse. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Can I say something about Jesus? Though he knows everything about you, he still offers you the proposition of answering the question. See, the Holy Spirit gave you an editorial in verse 4, and then he asked the question, Whom seek ye? And by the way, he already knows who's seeking him. They answered him and said, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus saith unto them, I am. Now, you'll notice that the word he is in italics, meaning that the King James translators added that. Can I just say, without correcting God's word, and I'm not here to do that, can I just say that Jesus said unto them, I am? And I think we know where that goes. Back to Exodus chapter 3, where Moses asked the question of the burning bush, whom God was speaking through, uh, whom shall I say sent me? I am that I am sent you. And Jesus is claiming deity. He is not saying I'm an elevated rabbi. 
He's not saying, I'm just some great teacher. I'm just some wonderful Jewish expositor. I am God in the flesh. Verse 6, as soon as he had said, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then ask ye them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, like, <laughs> like that wasn't enough. <laughs> Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, referring to the disciples, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And we know from the book of uh, Matthew that at that point, Jesus tells Peter to put his sword away and goes down and picks up an ear and places it back on Malchus's head and heals him. You say, well, that's weird. That's why it's called a miracle, duh. They don't happen very often. But I want you to tell you, I want to tell you the first gleaning we see from the garden. The first gleaning is this. Sin will blind you from receiving truth. Sin will blind you from receiving the truth. Now, I want you to think about this very logically and very carefully. Now, let me just say something about that. Christians, true, Bible-believing, God-fearing, God-honoring Christians, think logically. Amen. Is this an atheist convention? Somebody say amen. amen. All right. I know Bob's out of town, but you can say amen. But I want you to think about this very logically and very carefully this morning. If you were a Roman soldier who was about to bind and deliver Christ to Pilate, would you not at least reconsider your agenda after finding yourself flat on your back upon Christ's proclamation of I am? I mean, here come those Roman soldiers with Judas Iscariot after they had uh, commissioned to bribe Christ and take Christ for 30 pieces of silver under Judas. They come and they have their torches, they've got their staves, they've got their swords, and they're going to take Jesus Christ by force. He ends up going willing. He says, art thou Jesus of Nazareth? He says, I am. And they fall back. And while they're in the dirt, they ask a second time, are you Jesus? In the dirt. By the way, just to mess with our Pentecostal friends for a minute, the foes of Christ fall back the friends of Christ fall forward. That's right. Now, I've got to say this because it's fun. <laughs> Let me have uh, Elijah up here. Let me have Elijah up here. Elijah, come up here. Elijah, hurry! <laughs> Pastor Dan, would you get behind Elijah? Get behind Elijah. Now, you stand here. Stand here. Okay? Let me tell you what happens today in the fabricated churches. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You'll have some guy that claims to have the power of God who is fleecing the crowd for money, who usually wears white suits, breathes in the congregation. They all fall, but they didn't realize he had garlic. But anyway, <laughs> this is what happens. Touch the guy like this, and he goes, goes this way. No, 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 come over here, come over here. Stand right here. I want you to fall. Can, do you trust your grandfather? He is going to catch you. He's going to catch you. Come on. You're going to fall back, okay? Elijah, okay. fall back. Okay, pick him back up. Go have a seat. Thank you, Brother Dan. Thank you, Brother Elijah. Now, I want you to notice something. The only time you will see somebody fall back in the manner in which these Roman soldiers fell back in are the foes of Christ. But you, when you see Moses... It's always I fall forward. If you want to see uh, Isaiah in chapter 6, he falls forward. The friends of Christ fall prostrate. The foes of Christ fall back. Now you say, are you saying that everybody at those crusades are the foes of Christ? No, I, I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that's a gimmick and they learned it from the wrong folks. That's all I'm saying. 
is they learned it from the wrong folks. There isn't a place in the Bible where a friend of Christ fell back anywhere. But the foes of Christ all fall back. Now, if Jesus Christ's declaration of deity was not enough, then perhaps a demonstration of deity would be more convincing for these Roman soldiers. For that, I want you to keep your finger in John and go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and look at this uh, different account of the same account. Luke chapter 22, look at verse 50 and 51. Luke chapter 22, verse 50 says, And one of them, and we know this is Peter from John's gospel, And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as, a, as, as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Okay, so here comes the, the Roman soldiers, and one of them gets excited, named Peter, the one of the disciples of Christ, sees that these Roman soldiers are going to take his master, and he takes his sword, and he thrusts it towards Malchus and cuts off Malchus's ear. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of nerve endings and a lot of blood vessels associated with the ear. That had to be a very icky mess. But Jesus Christ puts an ear back on without a splint, Compress, morphine, plasma, doctors, nor the assistance of nurses, all without Obamacare. Amen. The great I am simply puts the ear back on as if it were never cut off. Amen. Now, wait a minute. This is strange. Let me make this clear. Sin will blind you from receiving or even accepting the truth of God's word. I mean, these Roman soldiers came to take Christ physically, and one of them gets their ear cut off, and after being blown over by the great I am into the dust of the ground on his backside, gets his ear cut off of his head, and the guy that they're trying to take for Pilate picks his ear off of the ground, places it back on the side of his head, and everything's fine. And they still continue doing what they came to do. You say, what's that called? I'm telling you, sin is bad. And it will blind you, not allow you to receive truth. Can I say something to you this morning? There might be somebody in here this morning whose ear can't receive the truth. Let me tell you another thing about this passage. We as Christians sometimes can mess things up. And thankfully, Jesus Christ comes along and cleans up our mess. Amen. Because Peter, like most Christians, we react to people. Amen. Let me put it this way to make it even more plain. Peter, like most Baptists, react to people. <laughs> and when we don't like something, instead of saying, let me share with you what the Bible says, we pick up our sword and we start hacking. <laughs> well, how dare you say that and how dare you? And then Jesus has to come along and say, what is wrong with you? Put your sword away and cleans up your mess. I wonder how many people have mishandled this sword and have been cutting off ears instead of changing hearts. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. It cuts. But it's not your business to cut. It's his business. You share, he cuts. John Newton, in his famous hymn, wrote Amazing Grace, and he said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. 
You say, why don't mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or friend or cousin receive Christ as their Lord and Savior? The answer is simple. They are blinded by their sin and do not see the need for Christ. There are people all over this country, all over this world, who can hear the Word of God intelligently proclaimed from a pulpit like this, and people will be blessed by it, but there's always someone who sits there and says, I don't think so. I don't think so. Sin is so strong. And it has such a hold on people that even in the face of two miraculous events, they continue in their sin. Lesson two, or the second gleaning from the garden. Salvation is a choice and is not determined by the miraculous. Let me say that again because we're going to mess around with another denomination again. Salvation is a choice and is not determined by the miraculous. See, if it were determined by the miraculous, as some would say, then Judas, along with between 50 and 100 Roman soldiers, should have walked away saved and Jesus Christ would have been unharmed. But the facts remain, Jesus was bound and led to Pilate, and the Roman soldiers were still under orders, and Judas is still the son of perdition. Look over to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, this is the passage where Jesus Christ recounts the uh, rich man and Lazarus. And of course, this is the passage that the friendly JWs with their neckties will say to you on the Saturday mornings. They'll say, there is no hell. But then Jesus Christ must have been lying about this account. But anyway, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, look at verse number 27. I'm picking up towards the end of this account. The Lord Jesus Christ is just telling... uh, Uh, The rich man, he says, Lazarus, he received poor things in his life. Now he's being blessed. In verse 26, he says, there's a great gulf fixed between you and him. And then in verse 27, here comes the rich man and says to Christ, Then said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou shouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, a miracle. They will repent. And he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Your salvation is not dependent upon a Red Sea parting. Amen. Your salvation is not dependent upon me taking my hands and making someone get pushed back. Your salvation is not dependent upon me taking my jacket off and waving it across the crowd and everybody as a, as a one big wave just falls back. Your salvation is dependent upon you understanding you are a sinner, that you are going to hell, that Jesus Christ paid for your sin debt, and unless you receive him willfully, you're going to hell by your choice. There's no other way around that. Jesus Christ did not send you to hell. He's trying to save you from hell. The salvation of your soul is determined upon a simple choice and not determined by a miraculous event. If the miraculous event was all it was about, then every Jew in the Old Testament should have been saved every time they saw a sign. I'm still, one of my best examples is I always give it. They come across the Red Sea on dry ground and picking up bass from the walls of water to their right and their left. I don't know if there's bass in the Red Sea, but anyway, but you know what I mean, tilapia, whatever is in there. So they're going, nice fluffy white meat. But anyway, so, so they're going through the Red Sea on dry ground, and they get on the other side, and they see the Red Sea come across, all across those, uh, Pharaoh and his army, and they're dead, and they're all fine. Not one of them has soppy feet. That's right. And the next thing is, God, can you provide me water? <laughs> what? <laughs> did you not just see what I did for you? Listen, the miraculous will never convince. There wasn't a Jew in the Old Testament who was better for those signs because they needed a continual reassurance, and that's why the Bible says the Jew requires a sign. Salvation of your soul is determined upon a simple choice. Think about this, folks. 
The first coming of our Savior was not heralded by pomp, by glitz, and by glamour. He was born in a manger, which is about as low as you can get, among the cattle, the goats, and the sheep, and not in a royal palace in a regal manner. Everything about our Savior's first coming was simple. Everything about our Savior's first coming, coming was, was truth. That is how you receive Him, a simple Savior through a simple gospel, through a simple choice. Amen. You say, but wait a minute, aren't certain people predetermined to heaven and certain predetermined to hell? Yes, if God was a cosmic prankster. Think about this. If I'm forced to love you, it is nothing more than a rape. But yet we have a theology that is made to sound better because it's akin to a flower. <laughs> Tulip. That says God has predetermined people before the foundation of the earth to go to heaven and predetermined people to go to hell. Really? Then why even ask the question of the Roman soldiers, whom seek ye? Why even would Jesus, who knew what they were thinking, give them the dignity to respond? Right. Salvation is a choice and is not determined by the miraculous. And Abraham told that rich man, he says, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, here's the translation of that, if they don't believe the book that is written, they will not believe the one rose from the dead. That's right. Right. Let me give you this third gleaning from the garden. The third gleaning from the garden. This is for you Christians. I'm going to hit on you for a little bit. Saved people are not perfect and can display sinful behavior. How many of you thought that was a shocker? <laughs> Saved people are not perfect and often display sinful behavior more often than we want to. See, Jim, get a witness there. There you go. See, if you're a child of God this morning, then you must understand that you are a work in progress that will not be completed until you are in Christ's very presence. John chapter 18, verse number 10. You don't need to turn there. I just want to read this to you. John chapter 18, verse number 10 says this. He says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Peter was chastised by the Savior for his behavior and felt as if the sword could take care of what a conversation could not. As Christians, we are to display the sword of the Word of God and let the Lord take care of the cutting and let the Lord take care of the smiting. We, we, when we reverse that role, we are in effect saying that we know better than God. When we reverse that role, we become the old Roman Catholic Church and we become the Muslim faith. Say amen. Amen. Because the whole point of the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th century Roman Catholic Church was to conquest the land, and the way they did it was through the shield and the sword. Pick up your history books. Don't look at me like I'm nuts. They said you either turn to Rome or you die by the sword. Millions chose to die and be in a better place. Muslims tell you, convert or die. A lot of people are dying right now. News media won't tell you that because they're more interested in Confederate flag junk. They're more interested in that stuff because, see, that's the smoke and mirrors to get your eyes off of other stuff. You see, there's all kinds of hell breaking loose in the world, and you're just all fixated on what MSNBC has to tell you. Listen, man, as Christians, we are to display the sword of the Word of God and let the Lord take care of the cutting and the smiting. And when we reverse that role, we are in effect saying that we know better than God. And let me say something to you. There are some people that I, honest to God, would act like Peter and just want to just whip them. There are people that have said things about the Lord. But you know what? Let me say something to you. I've gotten to the point now. Maybe it's, what is this word? I've matured. I've matured a little bit where I'm not as offended as I would be in the past. Because I know that if they don't get saved, they're going to get theirs. And I don't say that with any joy in my heart. But I would like to see them come to Christ. 
See, our objective according to this book is to preach the truth in love. Our objective according to this book is to display the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Our objective, according to this book, is to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our objective, according to this book, is to have peace which passes all understanding. And if we are doing those things and fulfilling what this book says we ought to be doing, then we will not be going around cutting people's ears off and drag our Savior's name through the mud in the process. But understand... Saved people are not perfect and can display and can display oftentimes sinful behavior. I love the world's philosophy. The world's philosophy says this, well, you Christians think you're better than everybody. No, let me tell you what I think. I think I deserve hell. That's what I think. See, I, I, I am fully aware. See, I know me really well, and me stinks. I know me. I know me, I'm, I'm deplored by my own behavior sometimes, and sometimes I catch myself in the middle of something and say to myself, my gosh, God just witnessed that. When, I hear, when, I, when something flies from my mouth to my wife or to my kids, or when it flies from their mouth to me, or, or whatever the case is, I, just am de- I am sickened by my own behavior. I'm going to tell you something. The world is cracked when it comes to knowing what about Christians. We judge ourselves more harshly than they even judge us. Judgment must begin where? The house of God. And let me say something to you. Knowing who I am, I'm glad Jesus Christ saved me. Because I'd have had no other way. I'd have had no other way. But saved people are not perfect and to display sinful behavior. I've heard, language come out of, I've heard language come out of Christians' mouths that'll make a sailor blush. I, I've, I've been engaged with some people that uh, have said some things to me that I thought to myself, why in the world are you telling me that? <laughs> I've said some things that I thought after I said it, why did I tell him that? <laughs> amen, amen. You know I'm talking about you, say amen. All right. <laughs> But understand this, though, though we are a work in progress and the words under construction should be tattooed to your forehead, though I really don't endorse tattoos, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> we should be daily conformed to the image of our son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me give you the fourth gleaning and we'll be done. You can't handle any more. Jesus Christ's death was voluntary. You say, where does that come from? Why is he even mentioning that, preacher? Look at John chapter 18. Let's finish this out. John chapter 18, back to our text. and Look at verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? It's a question. The answer is simple. What I'm about to engage in must be. Must be. While they bound him, and I'm sure they only did that out of protocol, I'm, because that would have been no match. <laughs> he voluntarily went voluntarily, now catch this, of his own will. Which is why he's not going to compromise yours. Nothing was going to stop Calvary. And I am so glad nothing did. In Matthew 26, verse 53, you don't need to turn there. Jesus responded to Peter by extension, you and I, and stated this. He says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? You go over to 1 Kings, and you, you read about what one angel can do. You think about 12 legions. That's got to be destruction. <laughs> but how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, Jesus said, that thus it must be? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad he didn't call those angels. 
and say, rescue me from this junk. Now, there's something interesting about this passage, too, this willful, voluntarily action on Christ's part. When I was in Bible college, I spent four years in that thing. <laughs> and there was a big argument about the impeccability of Christ and the peccability of Christ. You say, what are, what are those? Those are theological terms. I'm sure Pastor Dan goes right back to the time when you were studying and thinking, we're arguing about whether Christ was impeccable or peccable. And I remember a lot of people saying, I believe that Christ was impeccable. That is, he was unable to sin. And I always had a problem with that because I was the other guy that was peccable. I believe that Christ was peccable, being able not to sin. Let me say that again. Impeccable meant unable to sin. Peccable means able not to sin. Now you say, why the big deal? Well, how, do you, how does Jesus get victory over hell, death, and the grave if it's already planned and plotted for that way? Right. What's the whole point of that garden prayer about taking the cup away if it was all already preordained that it would happen the way it would happen? You know what that, point, you know what that garden prayer was? It was His human will saying, if there's another way of doing this, I'm all in on it. Nevertheless, not my will but thine. How do you get victory over hell, death, and the grave if you're unable to sin? You know what I think Jesus was able to do? He was able to keep the Ten Commandments. He was able to keep the law. He was able to keep everything that God the Father threw at him, and, and by extension to us, because he was able not to sin. That's why he was a perfect man. Amen. And if the Seventh-day Adventists would get that, they'd be Baptists. <laughs> Amen. Because that's what they're hung up on. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to make this clear. Judas may have betrayed Christ, and he did. The Roman soldiers may have bound his hands and led him to Pilate. And the crowd may have yelled, crucify him. But it was Jesus Christ who voluntarily went to the cross for you and for me. Amen. Yes, he was bound, but I'm sure he would have walked there just the same. And if he did not want to go, then it mattered not what Judas was paid. It mattered not that the soldiers would bind him. It mattered not what the crowds yelled that day. It only mattered that Jesus Christ did it all of his own accord and that scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus Christ willfully laid down his own life. Amen. No man takes it. No man takes this from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Kind of my own paraphrase. He says, I'm the one that does this. And by the way, you ought to be glad he did. Because you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. Someone would have to bind me and force me to die for you. I'd have a hard time dying for me let alone dying for you. Guess what? If it wasn't a voluntary death, then it wasn't a loving death. If it was the father strong-arming his son to do it, that's not love. Now think about that. It's the, the father's strong arm. Son, you're going to do this. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. Jesus willingly, voluntarily died for Mark Kirkpatrick. Jesus willingly died for Michael Jones. Jesus willingly died for Wolfgang Costello. No one forced him, and the Father didn't strong-arm him. He did it because greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now you say, well, it's just to fulfill some of those Old Testament uh, sacrifices and all that. Oh, sure, that's all part of that. Next week, we're going to talk about the tabernacle. If you've never studied those pieces of furniture out, then you're missing all the New Testament truth that those pieces of furniture give you. We'll talk about that next week. But Jesus Christ voluntarily gave his life Therefore, his love was free 
from being forced to die. Now you say, wait a minute, preacher. If he voluntarily died, that means I need to voluntarily believe on him. Amen. Yes. That's how that works. But you know what's, what's great about the Word of God? God doesn't say, I'm going to bend your arm and make you believe me. And I'm going to take one of my servants and put a sword to your throat and say, you better believe me. He doesn't do that. But he does say this. I might give you another 30 years. I might give you another 40 years. But you're going to die. Your, you know what I'm looking at? I'm looking at maggot food. How's that for a loving thing to walk away from church with, huh? I'm looking at maggot food. Every one of you are either going to be placed six feet down in a, in a $5,000, and you ain't worth it, a $5,000 casket lined with silk with your favorite CDs or your favorite whatever, and then they're going to put that thing in a cement sarcophagus because the EPA wants it that way, and then they're going to seal that thing, and they're going to put you six down in the ground, and they're going to put dirt over you. Good night. And some of you, because you're cheap, you're going to get cremated. You're going to end up in some bar ashtray somewhere. <laughs> or some of you are lucky to get raptured out of here. That's why I'd like to go. <laughs> but if it doesn't happen, one of those two other alternatives is going to be my it. <laughs> now listen. Wouldn't you like to be able to say what Paul said? Death, where is thy sting? And grave, where is thy victory? And the only way you can say that is if you know the one who conquered death and conquered the grave. Amen. And you do that by voluntarily saying, I want to be a Christian. Say, what are the gleanings from the garden? Number one, sin will blind you. Sin will blind you. Number two, it's important to understand that though sin will blind you, that the sword must be used the way that God wants you to use the sword. Number three, understand that Jesus Christ is not believed upon through the miraculous and that he died for you, fourthly, voluntarily. Praise the Lord for his voluntary death.